I'm Mark Jones. I head up the company Pondworks. We build custom waterfalls, fish ponds. We also breed goldfish. What started as a bit of an incident with a customer and resulted in breeding goldfish. My history in, fish, in the fish breeding world goes back to uh, a very young age. My uncle was one of the first to uh, breed neon tetras. Where I'm from in New Zealand originally, a love for fish keeping grew on from there. And before I knew it, we were breeding everything from African cichlids to bristlenose catfish and so on and so forth. Come on through. So what do we have in this room? Okay, so this is where we keep a lot of our brood stock. It's also our hatchery as well. When I say brood stock, this is more so grow out for brood stock or just fish that we can't accommodate in our ponds. Anything special that we're working with. There's numerous tanks of various size fish in through here. Everything from just a couple of days old down the bottom here. But these are shabuckers. Very cute. They're tiny. Like they're like this, the width of my fingernail. They're very small. There are some ranchers and arandas that we've sort of been playing with as well. This is sort of the first real batch of, of ranchers and arandas that we've started to play with. We primarily focus on comets and shabuckers. What type of rancher would you call these? Probably calicos. Yeah. And what can these retail for? Uh, depending on the size, um, look, even on the wholesale level, I've seen some ridiculous prices. A lot of it comes down to the size of them. When they're getting into the larger sizes, sort of 10 to 15 centimetres, and you've got good coloration and markings, you start talking upwards of $150 plus. Wow, and how long would it take for you to get them that size? Uh, probably a couple of years worth of growing there. Coming on over here. Just a, a mix of shabumpkins. The best thing about shabumpkins is once they're a month old, you start to see those colorations coming through. These guys are probably overdue on going outside to grow out tubs. These ones here, will these change color over time? Possible, possibly not. It's not uncommon to get over 50% of a batch of shabumpkins as all grows. On a commercial level, I suppose I've been involved since probably the early 2000s. We were breeding clownfish. Unfortunately, when the movie came out, did we have any fish available or ready for sale? <laughs> no, but uh, lots of orders and lots of requests. How about the breeding process for all your goldfish? Generally, we use a lot of natural spawning techniques. So we use a wool mop, place that in the ponds, you can normally start to see the activity, particularly in the warmer months, and we'll put those mops in and then collect them early hours of the morning. They'll then come into, into our hatchery room, into a separate fish tank, generally three to four days to hatch. A lot of that is temperature dependent. During the winter time, if you are lucky enough to get spawnings, I've seen them take six or seven days. But as a general rule, three to four days. A good friend of mine over in Perth, his season started very early, whereas our weather really sort of took its time before we started warming up this year. So we've probably had one of our worst seasons on record so far. I mean, in here, I'm guessing there's about 350 fish. I have no clue. Feeding these guys, what do you feed them? We primarily use a lot of, at the moment, we were using Envy, an aquaculture feed. Now we've changed over to Onhaimi, a Japanese aquaculture feed. We've also got some black moors down here. Yep. These are one of my favorites because these were, I think, one of the first fish that I kind of kept. They weren't the first fish I kept. My auntie took me to get fish for her pond and we picked up some of these. So do these get the telescope eyes? Yes, they will develop the, the eyes over time. Once again, it's like the old story of put two champions together, you don't get all champions. If you look at them from the top, you will see some have fan tails, some have single tails and therefore classified as a nymph. Still a perfectly healthy fish, but just has a single tail. Alrighty, so we'll come over, I guess, to this side now. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so females and they'll one rain tube in there as well. Yeah, so we're going to try breeding these today. Yeah, we'll do a hand spawning and uh, no guarantees we're going to get eggs out of them. They have been isolated for a little while. So rightfully so, they should be right. These are calicos? These are calicos, yeah. Calicos are the tricolour there as well. Seems to be a tricolour. Yeah. Beautiful. And uh, how old do these fish be? That's a very good question. They are imported fish. Um, I would envision somewhere possibly up to, up to maybe up to about two years. And do you ever have issues with these, is it called the when? The when. Um, never had to remove anything yet, but I dare say the time will come. 
Yeah, so they continue to grow and grow and grow. They're very beautiful though. Okay, so you're just getting some water and filling these buckets yeah, up? Yeah, just filling these buckets. So we'll use one bucket for our actual spawning tank out there, and the other bucket will be to move the fish in. How do you select the fishy on a breed? So, look, a lot of it, everyone's different about their, their shape and their coloration and everything they want to go to. In this situation, you can see that's a beautiful butterfly tail aranda, nice calico. And this one here's got some good traits of longer tail as well, and that larger wen. So you can see much, much larger flowing tail. So how do you sex them? Sexing fish is, as a general rule of thumb, your females are always more rounder than the abdomen and your males are always more longer and slender. So the basic idea is to manually extract the eggs and manually extract the sperm. And that's just done by a, uh, a slight gentle massage. So let's take these for a walk. So we've got some clean water. The water that we're actually spawning in, I don't find is overly critical because we're gonna uh, get rid of it. And the, the tanks around here, all the water's pretty well the same. So we'll just pick out some males. Well, I'm thinking this big boy here, Yep. He's got some lovely coloration in them. So probably not the most ideal colour. So there's three males to play with. So will this become the spawning tank? This is going to become the spawning tank. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Most of the time I like to start with the males and actually get a bit of sperm in there first. So generally, there we go, look, we were already getting a bit of sperm come out there. There was just a light cloud of, of white come out. And that's the sperm, but it's only a very gentle. All right, let's try a female. I'm thinking this tricolour. Sometimes they can be just as easy as they flick like that and out they come. She ain't giving up, mate. There ain't no eggs in her. Let's have a crack at these black moors and hopefully we can uh, get some results. Only problem is they're in a black bucket and now we can't see them. So these are beautiful big black moors, these guys. There we go. How cool. So the eggs are quite adhesive and they'll actually fall down and, and sort of land on the glass. One of the big things is once you start with the females too, you've got to make sure you express all those eggs out too. You don't really want to leave eggs behind. They could fungus up inside of it. That's right, yeah. Another male. Yeah. Female. Wow, look at that. Whoo, big stream there. Huge. So some of these eggs will adhere, or they should adhere to the bottom glass. You can see that they're still quite free at the moment, so some of them should stick, but more or less we've got to be able to change them. So we'll just let them sit for probably about 10, 15 minutes or so, and that way any sperm in there will fertilise those eggs, and we should be able to rinse them off. So you're going to do a rinse out now? Yeah, we'll just do a rinse. Just got some clean water here. This is going to be a little bit tricky. The eggs haven't um, adhered the way that they should have, and they may or may not be successful this lot. We'll a time will tell. So you can see there's some stuck to the glass yeah. in there. So we'll move these into the, into the shed and go and set these up. Okay, so this is just some clean water out of the parents' tank. We'll keep this water fairly shallow and that's more so because I'll add water to it over time. So once they start to hatch and right. everything, that way we're diluting sort of any ammonias and things like that that's building up. And the air stone running in the back and then some methylene blue. And we'll go fairly heavy on the methylene blue. So three mils in there. So this is going to make them quite dark. Yeah, no, there's no fungus going to grow on there, man. No, 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 definitely not. And then, of course, we'll slowly dilute. And once that tank's full, I'll actually siphon that back out and slowly start to change it. What temperature? Room temperature in here normally sits about 25 or so. In about three to four days, these will start to hatch. You don't feed them until they are, until you actually see them free swimming. Yeah. And then we just use a fry powder. Now start out this size, and then they grow to this size, and then they grow into <laughs> this size. That's it. So growing out goldfish, what's the process then? Water quality and lots of regular feeds. Water quality, I think everyone knows that you know nitrates do stunt the growth. Optimum foods in the younger years, that first year of a goldfish's life is most crucial to get maximum development out of it. Depending on the size, some of the goldfish here, we're probably our oldest might be from four to five years and he's a stonking solid 12 inches. So to grow them from babies to sellable size, what do you normally? We can do them in as little as three months.
Now these are a variety that I'm working with. These are a large scale comet. These are all fish that have been isolated. The scales on them are much larger than the normal and uh, almost to the point of being mirror scale. So looking at sort of developing these further and trying to fix that particular strain, I haven't even attempted to spawn these guys yet. There has been spawning activity in there, but I, I just haven't worried about it too much. You can see some have got longer fins than others, some have got shorter. Try and balance it out so that we get, you know, a good tail form and, and everything and hope for the best. And I guess these are a great alternative for koi. Yeah, so these are probably closer in having that uh, that Jin Rin coloration or that mirror scale pattern as well. So you get that lovely metallic look when you're looking down on top of the fish. Some beautiful big black moors. These are my daughter's fish. They quite literally get shot if I even contemplate or think about selling them. They're her pride and joy. But yeah, beautiful big fish. These are an electric red shabumpkin. So unfortunately as a juvenile, they don't exhibit anywhere as much coloration. So these guys have not been color fed. This is more natural coloration. If we put them on something like White Crane Super R or something like that, we'll probably get the colors even bolder again. Lost the original broad stock. This is some of the offspring that we've managed to keep them grow out. So I still haven't done any work with them yet to, uh, to spawn them. So what are these down here? So these are a lemon comet. Okay, lemon comet or yellow comet. These are quite a, a well fixed strain. You do see a lot of bronze in their spawn. And when I say a lot, we're talking 50% plus. Once again, we sort of lost a lot of our original broad stock. Yeah. And so this is offspring now sort of raising up to secure the future generations. I guess these will be very popular pond fish. Yes. Which is obviously what you want to be manufacturing. That's, that's, what, we, <laughs> that's what we specialize in. What's your favourite type of goldfish? All of them. They've all got their certain merits. Um, shabumpkins are probably our preference. We actually sell more shabumpkins than anything else. Shabumpkins are probably closer along those koi coloration lines. Yeah, while we do try to concentrate on a lot of red and white and sort of get into more of that sarasa style or kahaku style coloration. And then, you know, I've got my large scale comments here that is a strain that I'm currently working with and trying to fix to have something entirely different and, and entirely unique I suppose at the moment these are my favorite. What price range can you get for goldfish? Anything from five dollars through to 400, 500, 600. How long do you find goldfish live for? As a general rule of thumb 30 years is the general accepted consensus. Fancy's got their own set of issues as far as health requirements go and get a little bit trickier. But generally with comets and shabumpkins, yeah, 30 years is quite easily achievable. And what are we looking at here? This is sort of our current fancy collection. So we've got some Ryukins, lovely short squat, high back. I like the Ryukins, my wife doesn't. Um, she likes her Arandas and Arantus. And, uh, but everybody's different. Everyone's got their own preferences when it comes to these guys. Yeah, and they come in all different shapes and sizes. When it comes to ranchus, some people like that real egg-shaped fish, and some people want that longer body. My eye goes to like that one in the middle there. It's got a nice size wen on them, that one too. And what are these ones here? Are these are your aranda. Some are a bit more jelly head than others. Panda arandas, these are a very sort of un unstable colored hybrid. This guy was black and white, but um, he's just slowly gone bronze over time. So is that why the panda randas cost so much? Yeah, pretty much. They're very hard to keep them black and white. Various comets and shabumpkins. Oh, wow. Some magnificent colors in the shabumpkins. To truly appreciate these fish, you need to view them from the top. This is more our retail sales. So if you're coming in here to, uh, to look at purchasing fish, this is the main part you get to see. This is where you can come along and, and select and, uh, and choose your fish. Oh, wow, yeah. So this is a good way of displaying the fish. Okay, so there's a few Sarasa comets in there as well. 
something like this little guy. So this is sort of closer to a, a Tancho in, in the koi world. A bit of red on his back fin's no good for him, but um, if you just had that straight red circle, it wouldn't be too bad. When you start to look at some of your shabumpkins, you know, we start to see those variations in colour. We're getting, you know, more towards that sankey and, and shallow type colorations. So they've all got their own merits. Magnificent little fish. And they're very easy to look at and choose out the ones you like. Gorgeous. And did you breed these ones or are these imports? These are out of Perth, these guys. Wow. Yeah, we basically outstripped our demand. We, we did have plenty of stock and we've just been have it. So fortunately, um, as I say, my good mate over there in Perth, shout out to you, Ian, yeah. um, come to the party and uh, yeah, we, you know, we fly the fish across and I know that I'm getting, you know, good quality. These are lemon comets. Yeah. So there was a bit of activity in there and you can see the water's a bit cloudy, so I think we've all been chasing. So they just run around and create a bunch of cloud. The males are relentless. When it comes to any female that's in season, they simply do not let them alone. Probably why it's better for them to be in a pond. <laughs> exactly. And the thing with all these goldfish, you could put one of every one together, couldn't you? Yes, yeah, exactly. They all get along. As a general rule of thumb, we keep our single tailed fish with our single tailed fish. Okay, fantails and randers and things like that, we keep separate. And that's because they're a slower swimmer. And, uh, and of course, if there's a male that uh, doesn't want to leave a female alone, um, poor fantails absolutely bug it by the end of the day. So not only do we breed the goldfish to grow them up and, and stock the ponds that we put in the ground but we also offer them as a retail sale as well. For instance you might get customers who buy a pond off you and then they continue to come to you to supply their pond with fish. I suppose it's the big bonus they get to hand pick. Not every goldfish looks the same. Everyone's looking for that certain pattern it's just like their koi. You know if only we had koi here in Queensland unfortunately. <laughs> Not the case. Koi are classified as a noxious pest here in Queensland. Um, there's only two states in Australia where they're, and even then they're, they're only decriminalised really, wouldn't really call it legalised. Um, New South Wales accepts them and uh, Western Australia accepts them as well. The rest of the states and territories, unfortunately no, you're not allowed them. These are the electric reds that we showed you earlier on in the shed. Yes. So you can see the difference in intensity of colour um, as a juvenile, and they will go as intense as, as the other ones. Some more blackmores over here. They're actually an imported one. There's, uh, there's a couple of them that I've got put aside out there in the shed. They've just got that shorter tail. One of the big problems with long-tailed fish is if you keep breeding long-tailed fish all the time, your tails will slowly get longer and longer, and before you know it, you've got a a fish that's got some severe balance issues. So we do periodically have to come back and breed with a shorter tail to keep that gene pool in line. Well, they do look gorgeous, so fingers crossed they stay like that. So yeah, all the goldfish do need really hard water, right? Yeah, we find that they we get our best results at around five to six degrees of carbon hardness. Yeah, so very hard actually. Yeah, and we just generally use just bicarbonate to buff that up and bring that up. So there's a few different plants in here as well that we do offer. Uh, some uh, Ludwigia Super Red, um, some Rotala Blood Red. Um, these tanks aren't on CO2. There's just a standard LED light over the top of them at the moment. And do you use these plants in your ponds? We're actually getting there, yeah. We're using more and more. Um, even the Black Bacopa there growing uh, fully, fully submerged as well um, for something a bit different. These are Anubia's Giletti. These get huge. These will actually get to about 1.2 metres. Wow. And they will actually live in Queensland's climate quite well from what I've been told. You've got this flower coming through. Yeah, there's quite a few flowers in there. And when we redesign the backyard, I've got plans to plant a lot of these up around our waterfall. Will these grow in full sun? They just need their root? Probably not direct sunlight, yep. but yeah, filtered sun. And they just need their rhizome wet. That's right, yeah. If you look at their origins over there in, um, in Central Africa on the west coast, they sort of live more in the floodplains. How'd the idea come? I sort of got to owe, owe this to my, uh, one of my previous employers, Patrick, uh, whom I was working for. I was his operations manager at the time. I left there to uh, go back to painting uh, with a mate of mine and quite soon discovered that painting just wasn't for me. I actually went back to Patrick and turned around and asked him for my old job back and he turned around and told me, he says, I can't afford you. 
why don't you start building ponds? I started from there be almost five years ago now. And I've lost count how many ponds that we've put in the ground. We probably average 20 to 25 ponds a year. I've worked for two different national distributors I'm selling pond equipment over the years. And uh, to pretty much where we are today now, started building fish ponds. Instead of teaching people how to make them and telling people how to do it, now we get out there and physically build them and create lifestyles for people and their backyards. All right, so this system here we actually built uh, probably just over three years ago now. I'm already wanting to pull it apart and change things, but that's me. My wife wanted the spillway bowl that we've got over here, and she wanted it as close to the front door as possible. We ended up with a bit of a larger pond and stream, and it carried on. This is all lovely basalt that come, it comes from uh, Kin Kin up near Gympie. So yeah, you uh, don't realise all this landscaping that you actually have to do around the pond. That's like, right. It takes a fair bit to tear us it out and sort of work out a plan on what's going where and then to get that zigzag into the stream. So you got it coming all the way down here. It comes all the way down. Down, 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 down. Down here where we've actually got some goldfish swimming around. What goldfish are in here? This is just a misfit, a variety of comets in there. These are sort of fish that deserve a second life. I think in the front yard we don't sort of trust the show grade ones out here for obvious reasons. You have some beautiful plants here, so these are water lilies? These are water lilies. This is a, a tropical variety. This is a, an Evelyn Randig, a beautiful magenta coloured flower. Yeah, it's stunning. It's a beautiful front feature to your house. It's an absolute masterpiece, so you should be proud of yourself for it. It's really Thank beautiful. You. And you've got more of these out back. Can't start with just one pond, it's got to go further than that. Who taught you to build ponds? A lot of on-hands training, uh, along with Patrick and, and every, everybody else. Patrick was the first one to introduce aquascape into the Australian marketplace. That was probably nearly uh, 10, year, 10, 11 years ago now. There is a training program that you work through uh, to become a certified aquascape contractor. Yeah, so this whole system was built out of leftovers from jobs that we've done and become very good training ground for the boys that work with me as we gradually put pieces together. This pond has actually changed probably four or five times. Yep. And what started as a small pond, believe it or not, uh, it slowly grew. It got enlarged and this part here dug in and the waterfall section in the same week that we did the front yard. It's about 800 millimetres deep in the deepest point over there. It may not look like it, but down under all that elodia, yeah, there's a fair bit of depth there and you've got a ton of rainbows in here. There's lots of rainbows in there. A couple of Pacific blue eyes I can see as well. So this is a pond full of crimson spotted rainbows or Dubalay eyes. Yeah, just try to keep this one as natives for now and uh, come uh, the middle of April when we start work on the new ponds, this will be emptied entirely. But very soon, as I say, all this will be gone. So this has been a, just a, a continual process to lengthen the stream and uh, did used to come to round about here and probably about 18 months or so ago now we extended it along the rest of the way. There's fish up here you'll find a myriad of different plants throughout here as well a lot of sort of aquarium species. There's all the fish. This system here surprisingly is probably a, it'd be one of our most energy efficient. It's running a 8,000 litre an hour pump which drives not only up the top it drives the two turtle tubs as well and that pump only draws 65 watts of current. First is out the front running about a 15,000 litre an hour pump that's sitting about 165 watts. This was sort of training ground and experimentation and of course it's all set for demolition. You'll have to come back and, um, and film sure it again once it's all done. When we're building a pond, it's, you, know, you can have that back corner in your yard and, and everyone goes, oh, I'll stick it there because it's out of the way. But a pond stuck down in the back corner becomes a bit of a useless space because you've got to constantly venture down there. If you've got a pond that's situated with a view from your lounge room window or your kitchen window or somewhere like that, that you can walk past it and enjoy it all the time and get the real benefits of it, it's the sort of thing that you'll really, you know, uh, be, they become a labour of love. 
and you really do enjoy them and appreciate them a lot more for what they are when they're close by. Okay, so this is sort of one of our main broadstock ponds. So he was originally in a uh, swimming pool that had been converted to a fish pond and the house was sold, the pool was zoned for demolition. We had to get in there and, and catch him and uh, it was no easy feat. There's various lilies in here as well. Um, How many different types would you say? It's a good question, Nick. I've lost count. <laughs> okay, probably, so... Probably half a dozen different types of lilies. Wow. This one here is just a, that's a white with a yellow centre. There's a few nocturnal lilies in here as well. Which ones are those? Um, this one here. Up there's a nocturnal, so which they means a, uh, they open at night. The oh. males open at night. And do they close in the morning? They close in the morning, normally about 10 a.m. or so. They so close these will close at night? These close at night, yeah. So you'll always have flowers. That's right, yeah. All new to me. Also got a few turtles. Great pets, but you've got to be dedicated to own a turtle. You really do. It's a real big thing. Everyone sort of, oh, I've got a penny turtle. You know, it's going to stay as the size of a penny. Well, not quite. You know, um, this girl here has still got a bit of growing to do. So this is Shelly, and um, she does like fingers. So um, don't get your finger too close to the bitey end. Quite an all right turtle. She's our most dominant of, of our turtles now. The three here, uh, they all do not get along. One of the other ones was driven out of the pond by her. How old is Shelly? Um, we don't know. She originally came from the RSPCA, so we're not 100% sure of her age. We suspect that uh, she's probably maybe five or so, somewhere around there. It's, it's sort of very hard to tell. And what type of turtle is she? Uh, so she's a Macquarie Eye or a Brisbane River Short Neck. We feed a, a wide variety, everything from crickets to mealworms. Um, there's always sort of a lodia in these tanks for them to graze on. Rock melon, watermelon, bok choy, lettuce. They'll eat a wide variety of things. And one of the surprising things, everyone wants to feed them on, on beef heart and things like that. It's only good when they're, when they're juveniles. As they get more mature, their actual diet starts to become more vegetative and they need more vegetable matter in their diet. She's sizing up my hand there at the moment and she'll, hopefully she won't bite me, but I wouldn't put it past her. We've certainly had her for a few years now and yeah, they've been interesting pets. More for a dedicated pet owner. Yeah. We've got another turtle in here. Do they go in the same water as well? Yeah, these all circulate through the same water. So they can probably smell each other. Um, when we rebuild the new ponds, they'll be able to see each other. They can become friends then or something, I don't uh, know. Oh yeah, that'll be nice, but I don't <laughs> like the odds. Oh, beautiful. And this is a smaller turtle? This is a smaller turtle, yeah. Same type? Same type again. And she was actually rescued from a, uh, a shopping centre pond that we maintain. So she was dropped in and this friendly little soul come up and visited us and it was like, Wow, you're way too clean to be here. So somebody had released her thinking that she was getting a better life. But, um, disappointing. Yeah, very disappointing. So she's come home and um, she's been here sort of ever since. What's her name? Uh, this is Coco. Coco. <laughs> yeah, so this is my daughter's favourite turtle. Great animals and look, you can see how sedate she is too. Yes. Maybe because she's a little bit younger, had a bit um, of a better life, I don't know. Yeah, possible. Yeah, she's been used to living in a tank. I would say before she was released into a, into a fish pond. The two totes for now, we've got plans for a new larger pond for them. These existing ponds, this is probably one of the last chances to really sort of see them because um, they are going to be destroyed, um, filled in, and uh, we're starting again with stage two. All right, so this is basically our grow out area. Once our fish have sort of reached three and a half centimetres or so, um, we bring them out here into these IBCs for, for future grow out. Believe it or not, these guys are pretty well all started out being the same age and the same size. And you can see the different growth rates that are achieved in there. How's it go harvesting these? Normally I put Melanie inside there and she's small enough to climb inside. <laughs> so she's only eight and get her in there with a the net and she goes to town. I'm getting too big and old to climb inside those things. <laughs> There's also a bit of broad stock down here as well. Whoa. Beautiful big shabumpkin there, three or four years old. Very cool. Out of guess. Wow. So yeah, beautiful coloured fish. This is something that we're just starting to work with. You can see that black coloration, that black band. And this is a colour we're trying to get in more to get that black, red and white coloration, more of that shower or more of that sanky type colour. 
And what's in these ones? So these ones are empty at the moment, apart from a few striped marsh tadpoles and a lily that's growing out. No doubt most of our lilies will all end up in these tubs once we start our backyard makeover. Well, I guess this, this ends everything, does it? This pretty much sums it all up, Nick, yeah. Wow, well, thank you so much for taking us through, Mark. Oh, thank you, Nick. Been, I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, no, it's absolutely fascinating to see all this stuff. I'm not an experienced goldfish breeder or keeper by any means, but I find it very interesting to come and check it all out, well, so. It might only be a matter of time if you convince your parents they need a pond. Maybe, I don't <laughs> know if I can convince my parents. Maybe one of my friends or something. That's sure. it. But, um, no, what you can do is absolutely beautiful. And yeah, thank you so much for letting me come through. Not a problem at all, mate.